Welcome to episode 123 of Rebirth Revolution. My name is Melissa Olson. This week, I want to talk about change and the resistance to change. First off, the word resistance brings up a negative feeling for me. It seems to me that we all need to change, some more than others, and that resistance is the opposite of what we should be doing right now. Obviously, we should be resisting that which is not based in truth, but resisting change to that which needs changing feels irritating. But the presence of resistance is nothing more or less than the signal that there is a larger topic that we are ready, as a collective culture, to grapple with. Resistance is the precursor to change and as such is exactly what we need right now. We need the resistance and we need the change. As we move forward, we are destined to find ourselves at inflection points. An inflection point is when either an event occurs or a decision is made that has the power to alter the course of your life. We often dread inflection points. We get so comfortable dealing with life on the terms that we are used to, even if they are not optimal. We dread being thrown into a moment when we will have to rethink our lives, even though those are the moments when we often make choices that make things infinitely better. But it never looks that way. It just looks like forced growth. I was thinking about this when watching the most recent episode of Somebody Somewhere on HBO. In it, spoiler alert, a woman is told that her husband is having an affair with her best friend and business partner. What really got me was understanding and really feeling the anguish this woman felt because she had been told this terrible news. She was angry that she knew what she had no desire to know. She found out in one moment that the entire foundation of her life was not what she thought it was. And so she was going to have to do something about it. Those moments in life are just the worst. The ones where you wish you had a time machine so you could travel back into time when none of this was real. None of this was going to require your attention. This terrible moment was her inflection point. There was no unknowing what she now knew. Inflection points do not come when we call, because we would probably never choose to call them forth. We as a species are pretty slow to acknowledge any circumstances that will require us to change or to make changes. We are not comfortable with change. It is too much work. It is too full of the unknown. We never venture into the unknown with the total belief that we will be able to handle whatever comes our way, even if we have a lifetime of evidence that shows we have always made our way through somehow. When we are at an inflection point, we have three options. One, we can leave everything as is rejecting growth and pretending we were never told. Two, we can double down going deeper into the current state, angrily rejecting any need for growth. Or three, we can muster the courage to go in a different direction, which is where growth is found. Inflection points can come from bad things happening, and they can come from good things happening. There was a real moment of clarity for me back in 2016 when Beyonce released Lemonade. It was such a work of brilliance. I listened to nothing else for weeks. At the time, it occurred to me that women and women of color were just killing it. You had, in addition to Beyonce, Adele, Rihanna, Taylor Swift, and the like, sharing phenomenal work. This felt like an inflection point 
brought about by their heightened level of artistry, and I immediately sensed that a backlash was on its way. And I wasn't wrong. Racism, sexism, misogyny, you know, these are all really revving up in the last few years. This is the equivalent of doubling down on resisting growth. Some made the choice to hold them back instead of stepping up to the new standards they were creating with their brilliance. The excellence they brought into the world meant that things could no longer be what they once had been. So that left choices two and three. Those who were not up to the challenge to improve their skills in a world in which Beyonce can make lemonade must lash out against it. And those who are working at a higher level mustered the courage to ask more of themselves and their work. We as a culture are at a very important inflection point. The topic that we must now deal with is how we will care for one another. The topic is social responsibility. We need to decide as a culture what we are willing to do to secure the well-being for others. Our answer to this fundamental question will define the world we live in. Our inflection point arrived with the COVID pandemic. It is an event that becomes a turning point for us all. We can ignore it and pretend it's not happening, or we can march in the streets to make sure no one is kept safe, or we can use this inflection point to decide how a society should care for its members. We can decide how to support and promote everyone's well-being. We can do the work of figuring out who we want to be in relation to everyone else in the culture. And like every other inflection point, we didn't see it coming. The brilliance of the COVID inflection point is that it has affected every single person and every single system that holds our society in place. There is no part of our lives that has not been touched by the COVID inflection point. It gives us the opportunity to rethink it all. This gift is not something we would have ever asked for, but here it is. Now what? That's what we get to decide. In thinking about inflection points, I am reminded of a huge one in my life. Almost 20 years ago, my husband died. At the time, my children were young, and we had all been through a really rough final chapter with him, which played out over about three years. In those last years, and particularly in the last few months of his life, the subject of his imminent passing was not glossed over at all. We had countless discussions, including the children not only telling him that it would be okay for him to go, but drawing him pictures of what his life would be like on the other side. I realize that sounds pretty unusual, but it didn't feel like it at the time. They drew him in what they believed to be much cooler clothes than he chose to wear here on earth, which we all had a good laugh over. We also did a full-blown Thanksgiving meal in summer since it was clear he would not be around come November. We just took each and every day and made it whatever he wanted it to be. It is always devastating for a child to lose a parent, but as far as these losses go, this one lacked the cruel shock of a death that no one saw coming or some of the other ways that a parent can go that leave heavy, heavy scars. We were truly blessed to have the time to process it the way we did. After he died, I took them to a group that was specifically for children who had lost a parent. I thought we'd do this until they decided they no longer needed it, which worked out just fine. While the children met with others in their own age groups, the surviving parents met in another room. 
The room was electric, which was difficult to see, but impossible to not feel. All of the atoms of the parents involved were vibrating with fear, anger, hope, confusion. The juxtaposition of that intensity with the boring, insignificant questions the leader was asking was crazy-making for me. Everyone's puzzle pieces had been thrown in the air with some of the pieces missing. We wouldn't know what gaps we would have to plug until they fell into place. Everyone in that room was going to have to turn into someone they had never had to be in the past. They had to figure out how to become two parents. There is nothing more exhilarating than the feeling of all the molecules vibrating and shifting about. It was so ripe with the possibilities for growth. Everyone was at a precipice where they needed to choose to either retreat and fall into a sad and pitiable life or bust out into an entirely new person who they didn't know could exist. They would either turn into a superhero or they would choose to give up and live on the mercifully low expectations of others since they had been through such a tragedy. We only get so many crossroads in one life and hopefully they don't all come about that way. But they are all sacred and the most important junctures in our lives. The reason all your molecules are vibrating wildly is that you have a precious opportunity to rearrange yourself into something new and unknown. This is a holy moment and should always be treated as such. I could feel that in the room of people. I could see through their pain and confusion and see that they were vibrating all over the place. It was a holy moment that was completely ignored by the leader who asked things like, what is your child going to dress up as for Halloween? I wanted to stand up and scream. It seemed like such a waste of time to not acknowledge what was really going on in that room, to squander the opportunity to speak the truth among the only people who might understand in that moment. It was as if the raw emotions that everyone was feeling, the huge range of emotions that this sort of event brings up, were entirely too much for polite society. So everyone sat quietly, and we all answered the inane questions. When life gives holy moments, we need to have the courage to really dig in and mine all of that for everything it has to offer. Your inflection points are not to be avoided. They are your moment to shine. We have all experienced the joy of dealing with smoke detectors. They are wonderful devices, real lifesavers, but often have an opinion on how you're cooking your dinner, which leads to the violent shaking of a dish towel until the smoke detector stops. But other things make me think of smoke detectors, like illness, relationship problems, raising children, etc. Let's take illness. When your body is in a state of breakdown, whether through illness or some form of discomfort, it is trying to tell you something. Your body is setting off the smoke detector. It is warning you that it is in a state of inflammation or toxicity of some sort, or you have hurt yourself somehow. Western medicine is in the business of telling you how, through pharmaceuticals, to take the battery out of your smoke detector so it will stop wailing. It doesn't make the smoke go away. It doesn't figure out the source. You just won't have to listen to it anymore. Pills do the work that is normally reserved for your dish towels. I get that the alarm is annoying, and at some point you will do anything to make it stop. But shouldn't you first look for the source of the smoke? 
Is taking the battery out really the wisest option available? The blasting smoke detector is a gift that is trying to tell you that something you are eating, drinking, or doing is creating damage to your body. It is alerting you to an inflection point. Let's say that you're in an unhealthy relationship. Conflicts pop up again and again and get more difficult as time goes on. There is no peace. There is no seeing eye to eye. The smoke detector is blaring. Instead of realizing that this toxic pattern is not going to improve, you pull the battery out. You remove the audio red flag that is waving in your face time and time again, just hoping to get to the quiet space between the blow-ups. You choose to ignore the inflection point, which solves nothing. Let's say you have a small child who is getting in trouble in school. The teachers and administrators are contacting you, wanting to discuss possible solutions for your child's unacceptable behavior. They are the siren you hear. The decibel level is low when the child is new to school, and it keeps getting higher with each passing grade. Everyone except the parents realizes that this has gone from smoke to a full-on fire that is no longer manageable. But the parents took the battery out years ago because they just couldn't imagine little Johnny was anything other than an angel. They took that position and stuck with it until it was too late to remedy. Look for the source of the smoke when the alarm first goes off. The longer it wails or the quicker you are to remove the batteries, the more damage there will be to undo. We as humans often take the easier route of defending the status quo when we encounter resistance. That takes a lot of effort. The more productive route would be to stop, look, and listen to what the resistance is trying to say. Quit waving your dish towels and recognize the power of the moment. You can begin the work of fixing anything once you stop defending your right to not know what is happening. The discomfort you are willing to experience now may be the doorway to the best life for us all. Thanks for returning for another week of Rebirth Revolution. Thanks for your generosity of spirit that keeps you involved in the mission of trying to make this world a better place. You and your choices make a huge contribution, even if no one else knows. You can always let me know how you're doing by emailing me at rebirthrev at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Rebirth Revolution can be found on all the podcast apps, the music apps, and full episodes can be found on YouTube and on our Facebook page. Please subscribe, download, and share whenever possible. Until next week, think about the holy moments in your life. Ask yourself if you can hear a smoke detector going off. Get vaccinated, wear an N95 mask, and order your free test kits. And trust in your ability to handle anything that comes your way. Remember, you are loved exactly as much as every other person on the planet, not one ounce more or one ounce less. Stay strong and safe and willing to entertain the discomfort. <laughs>